Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Markets and Morality, the show where we look behind the curtain at issues where the left-right divide need not apply or when what people think they think about the right isn't true. I'm Emma Revel, Head of Public Affairs at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and in this episode I'm asking, can the UK level up in a free market way? This year's Richard Koch Breakthrough Prize offered a £50,000 prize for the best pro-market, pro-enterprise way to supercharge growth, employment and living standards across the UK. Run by the IEA and supported by author and businessman Richard Koch, this year's prize was won by Timothy Foxley and I'm delighted to have him on the show today alongside our runner-up at Michael Donez. Thank you both for joining me. I will get onto your specific ideas that won and you know came second in the prize in a minute, but I wondered if you could if I could start by me asking why do you think level up is so important for Britain? You know, the government have made it a, a, an important plank of their, you know, um a, pledges and, and manifesto in the last election and they'll certainly be judged by it. But uh, Tim, if we start with you, why do you think it's so important for the UK that we, you know, tackle this issue? Yeah, sure. So I think I'd start by saying um, I grew up in Stoke-on-Trent. It's one of those um, sort of quintessential behind areas. It's a, a post-industrial town sort of straddling the uh, the Midlands and the North. And um, seeing it from, from the inside out, what you the sense that you get growing up in an area like that is just of a, a sense of decline and of a lack of opportunity. So aside from looking at the, um, at the stats and looking at how much um, lower earnings might be in those areas, um, how much lower living standards might be and how much um, higher, say, unemployment might be. Those are all quite abstract concepts, but the, the sense of decline and the sense of a lack of opportunity is um, is quite damaging. Um, I think so from a moral point of view, we've got we've got that to tackle um, because, um, you know, it, it's not good for a huge swathe of our country for, for children to be growing up, um, going to school um, and then possibly off to university thinking, there's nothing for me here. All my family are here. I love the place, it's where I grew up, but there's nothing for me, so I need to go somewhere else. You know, just um, entirely from a, a moral point of view, that's um, that's something that we need to solve. But then we've also got the effect that it has on the UK as a whole. Um, so I think from 1998 to 2018, um, London grew at 3.1% per year. The North East was growing at 1.5%. It's less than half. There's um, a whole lot of productivity which we're missing out on. And if um, if we want to make the whole country um, more wealthy, and we want to, you know, have a, a more dynamic economy, then we can't just do it by relying on one area. And we need to we need to level up those areas. Um, you know, it's it's obviously a slogan which um, people instinctively knew what was meant by it, and um, you know, which which people people was something which needs to be tackled. Um, so there's there's many many good reasons for it. Michael, what about you? What inspired you to get in, uh, you know, to enter this year's Kosh Prize? Well, for me, levelling up is a very personal, passionate thing, but same reason I think a lot of other people are, much like uh, Timothy as well. The, for me, I came from, uh, from Nottingham in the Midlands. Uh, it's like everybody else in my year in school, we all sort of trooped away to university and then we kind of didn't come back. Um, and that was a bad thing for the town because you know, the school I went to, we were the people who provided the accountants, the lawyers, the kind of the, the, the middle ranking uh, jobs that, that kept the town going. And ultimately in time became the entrepreneurs and the businessmen, the people who would actually go and take an idea and make it something that would employ people in town. And we, we've all gone to London instead, or at least we had until recently. Um, and for me, therefore, thinking about how to go and, and, and tackle that challenge is, is something that keeps haunting me as a kind of personal guilt, I suppose. Um, it keeps striking me that it was always totally rational for people like me to, to come down to London because the connections were better, the opportunities were better, the jobs were there, the social life was, was you know, second to none in the world. Why wouldn't you go and do that? Fine, but the consequences if you're not doing that back home are bad. Um, and figuring out why we, uh, that kept happening and how you could potentially reverse it is something which has kept nagging me for years. Um, so I was really glad to have an opportunity when COVID hit to go and write about how, how we could actually possibly use this moment to, to turn the dial back the other way uh, and ship some people back up into places where they can make a real difference. Yeah, I think that's very true. I'm in I'm in a similar boat. You know, I, I'm I'm from Scunthorpe. I I certainly left uh, not straight after university. I went back for a bit, but then but then moved to London again. And you do sort of think, well, I feel a bit guilty about it. Um, but it seems like the only the only sort of feasible option when you're young and looking to start a career. Um, Tim, if we start, uh, if we go back to you. Um, can you outline very briefly, you know, the idea that bagged you the the top prize, the uh, the people's rebate? 
Sure. So the uh, the people's rebate essentially is um, a, a way of cutting taxes um, to encourage um, growth um, across the UK and to support um, increased living standards and support employment, but to do that in such a way that it's targeted at those left behind areas. So I, I sort of came into this with two ideas. One is that um, we know that um, cutting taxes is the way that you increase prosperity. You don't increase prosperity by government spending. Um, but also, if you cut taxes generally in the UK, what you're going to do is naturally advantage the South East um, and London and the high earners anyway. So it's never going to be politically possible to cut taxes to the level where you're going to um, actually boost entrepreneurship and growth um, and make the economy more vibrant um, to an extent that's going to help the left behind areas um, without um, people in those left behind areas thinking that you're giving a tax cut to the rich and there's not going to be any money left to spend on the public services which they need. Um, so I sort of took those two ideas together and thought, well, is there a way of targeting tax cuts at um, left behind areas specifically? Um, and sort of, is there a way that you can sort of mash those two things together? So the idea I came up with was the, the people's rebate, which um, is a scheme where what would happen is um, the whole country would be split up into to deciles by local authority areas um, based on the average earnings of the people who live within it. So from the, um, the sort of lowest earning decile to the highest earning. And then people who lived in that area will get um, a rebate each year on their um, income tax and their national insurance contributions and the and businesses will get um, a rebate on the employer's national insurance contributions as well. And that would be on um, a scale from 90% of all of their taxes in the uh, the lowest earning decile um, up to 0% in the, um, in the top earning. So then people who live in those left behind areas would be getting 90% of their taxes back, which they can go and spend in the local area, which will immediately boost their um, living standards and which will encourage talented people, especially people who are likely to be on a high salary, um, either now or later in their careers to move to those areas rather than staying in areas where they don't get any discount on their taxes. And that's essentially the people's rebate. And then it would, every year, it would recalculate. If uh, an area is earning more, then it might move up the deciles. If an area is not doing so well, it might come down and everyone in it gets a bit more tax back. And essentially, that's it. Um, Michael, Zoom Town seems very appropriate given that we are recording this from our respective homes and offices and uh, apologies for all the Wi-Fi interruption that may well uh, be occurring to your videos and audios now. We're doing our very best. Um, aside from dodgy internet connections, how would Zoom Towns work? Well, the idea is that you want to try and create towns which are in which remote working is, is more than just people hiding in their spare rooms or, or in their attics, uh, but to create places where people consciously know that they've got a good opportunity to work remotely and to locate those Zoom towns in places where the economy really needs the boost. So um, there's some real world examples that have already kind of been doing this, places like Hebden Bridge uh, or Slough New Yorkshire, for example. And just thinking about trying to do that in a more systematic and organised way. All of us have our stories about people who moved out of London uh, in the pandemic, uh, and those people may not be coming back uh, in, in many cases, but they're probably going to be scattered uh, across a whole landscape. If you can give them a few places where they really know that they are uh, a force to be reckoned with and welcome and they feel part of a community, and they have places they can go to work, and they, have, have, they can uh, lobby for really high-quality broadband, and they can engage with the local community in a... It, Something which creates Sorry, uh, Michael, we, we a basis for people to be more. Sorry, we lost you after local community. I don't know if you were able to pick back up from engaging local community, possibly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so people are able to engage in their local community and, and be, a, be a part of something. And the people who are local feel like they've got some control over it as well. It's not just something that's happening to them. Add that all together uh, and put it in, in with a couple of snazzy governance options to go and make sure that you can run the planning system in a more effective way and you can cover the costs uh, without incurring a lot of government debt. That potentially adds up into a useful package that can tackle one of the key problems that's always been at the heart of, of levelling up, which is getting high value human capital up to the places where it's currently missing. If you can do that, then in theory, you've got a useful tool that you can start to erode away at this classic problem and hopefully create a seabed for innovation in the future. Well, also, I suppose if you have the whole sort of community and local government infrastructure working towards solving problems, like the downsides of home working, the isolation and the dodgy Wi-Fi, then, you know, you, you, you make it more attractive and a more reasonable um, 
prospect for people. I suppose it's a digital commuter belt, perhaps, if uh, there are people who do still want to commute in occasionally. Um, one of the requirements for the cost... That would have been great. Yeah, indeed. One of the uh, requirements for the cost price was that it be politically possible. How much political will do you think there is to get this done, given that levelling up will inevitably, I think, reduce the appeal and draw of London and the South East, which is where many policymakers live? Uh, I mean, do you think it is inevitable, Tim, or is that me making a poor assumption that levelling up might not have the investment from policymakers that we hope? No, I think I think you're right. It it, it clearly is going to create political problems um, in the southeast. But I think that goes for however um, it's being done. Um, and there's always going to be a fight against um, taking money, which comes mostly from taxes raised in the southeast and, and London, and and spending them up north. And there'll be an even bigger backlash to to other schemes, you know, such as picking up a, a load of civil servants who are happily settled in in Whitehall and you know dispersing them in places which they've uh, which are you know, um, further away than they've ever travelled, probably from uh, from Houston or wherever. Um, so that's that's actually going to to occur as a problem for for any um, policies which we come up with. Um, so I thought about this a lot um, in relation to the people's rebate, um, and naturally there is um, going to be opposition if you if you offer lower taxes um, to some areas and not others. People who are in higher taxed areas are you know, not going to be happy with that. I think to start with, it would be important that taxes on people in, in those areas aren't raised to pay for, you know, the, the shortfall um, that comes from taxing people in other areas lower. Um, it'd be nice for that to come out of government spending rather than uh, rather than increased taxes, because that would completely defeat the purpose of the whole policy. But I think there's a point to be made, which is that um, the way that the UK economy currently is, um, and how unbalanced it is, that creates problems in itself. And the South East of London effectively subsidises the rest of the country. Year after year, it has been doing for decades. People make money and are, and are taxed in London and the South East, and that's spent on um, all sorts of social policies in the rest of the country. And um, I think I found that the, uh, the NHS spends 12% um, more per capita in the North West than it does in the South East. Um, so... If we don't do anything and if we don't fundamentally realter the balance of the economy, this will continue and people in the South East and in London will continue subsidising people in other areas of the country forever more. And if that point is made to them that um, a policy which can actually shift that balance and which can lead to improved living standards in the rest of the country and lead people in the rest of the country to earn more and to create more of a tax base there, and to consume you know, fewer public services, which will cost them less in the long term. I think that's just the point that would have to be made to make it politically acceptable. Um, because otherwise, um, we could be here in 100 years and women would still be paying for whatever the government of the day's favourite social policies are um, in you know, um, the North West or, or Wales or Cornwall or wherever else. This is true. Um, Michael, what do you think about the political reality when it comes to levelling up? Because, I mean, some people have said it's just a slogan and it means, you know, levelling up can mean whatever you want it to mean, really. It doesn't have a kind of concrete political narrative to it. Do you think that's true? Well, uh, it's, uh, I agree. It's hard to go and make it real. Um, and that is a real problem. I mean, uh, if we could just go and solve this by going and sticking a, a gold obelisk in the middle of a town and, and, and bowing down to it, we'd have solved this uh, decades ago. Yeah. Uh, it's not a, uh, something that you solve through a quick and easy fix. It's hard things to take decades to potentially to go and erode down. There are plenty of communities that feel left behind where, which I, I've had to engage with professionally, where they, they felt as if they needed some particular piece of infrastructure, which I know you couldn't deliver in 15 years time, or you need to go and figure out how to get people coming out of school with better exam results and then staying put to go and do jobs in the town. Those things are not easy to do. So I, I think there's a real trouble in showing the results. In some ways, this is, well, this is a great price because it's given us an opportunity to go and widen the toolkit a little bit. Um, but in terms of the, of the politics down south, um, I would say you can, you've got a fair amount of goodwill but it's, uh, available for levelling up. I mean, don't forget how many of the people who are big supporters of levelling up have got sorry uh, commuter belt constituencies. The south has got lots of things that mean actually it would benefit from levelling up happening. The south hates change most of the time. I mean, try getting a planning application in somewhere in the, in, in the green belt. It doesn't happen fast. They'd be delighted to go and see all those a uh, bunch of factories springing up in, in the north, you know, far away from the view from their, from their oranges. 
um, and we'd be able to, is, is, is to go and, is, and solve their tax growth challenges, as you say. So in theory, I think the, the biggest uh, problem here is actually getting the job done far more than it is in, in, in showing people as an opportunity. If you can convince them that it'll go and make life a little bit greener and leafier for them, then they'll probably be behind it. Um, I've touched on this a little bit, Michael, but uh, the second key element of the prize was it be pro-enterprise. Do you worry that the levelling up narrative is focused on what the state can do to help? You know, big infrastructure projects, taxpayer funded bridges, train stations, roads, or smaller pots of money for prettier high streets, you know, flowers and on the high street and stuff, instead of actually, you know, a, a pro-enterprise, pro-business vision for levelling up? Mm. Well, it's a real challenge, this one. I, I, I remember, because um, I'm a civil servant by day, uh, watching as uh, colleagues were working on the industrial strategy uh, a few years ago. I couldn't help thinking as I looked at it uh, that there were a lot of people here trying to think about how you could make growth happen, and no one actually had a, a kind of an obvious pathway to making it occur. And actually, I mean, if you think about most of the things that make the UK a competitive economy, they're actually UK-wide. You know, we have a very competitive labour market. We've got very ready access to capital for business. We could go on down a good long list of, this, of things that, that work right as much in the southeast as they do up in the north, northwest and northeast and in, in Yorkshire and similar. But those things don't go and bite in, in those communities. And the reasons for that are, are mysterious to a certain extent. Now, it's one of the reasons why, why as I say, I put a value in human capital personally, because I think the people who go and take, get all those things and put them together into one single um, uh, economically useful unit are probably the, the missing ingredient for a lot of this stuff. And the more of them we could get, the better the results are we get. Um, and you're right, the, the, the risk with uh, levelling up is that you need to have something to go and deliver the goods. So you point to the shiny euro you've just gone and, and, and finished off and cut the ribbon on and say, look how much levelling up. And then you don't look a week later to see whether anyone's used it or not. Mm, hopefully they will. Um, but it's being able to actually go and have something that does the magic ingredient behind all this that was very readily available you know, 150, 200 years ago, that is quite hard to do. Tim, what do you think? I mean, tax cuts based uh, across the country uh, is a is a very pro enterprise way of looking at it. But do you worry that actually, you know, when people talk about leveling up, they often look less to tax cuts and more to you know building projects and what the state can offer? Yeah, I mean, um, all politicians love a, a ribbon cutting, don't they? Um, <laughs> and, and you know what? Some of that that infrastructure is um, it's a necessary condition for. Um, economic growth but it's not a sufficient condition you know it's it's not going to create it in and of itself wealth is created by um, entrepreneurs and, and businesses growing and offering goods and services and I think this is where the uh, the government has slightly run out of ideas I mean the uh, the leveling up fund is a, is a classic example of um, a sort of Whitehall based vanity project I mean um, the 50 million pounds for football pitches I think is, uh, is one of the things that's been announced from it and you know, um, yeah, people in left behind areas may well want to go and um, have more football pitches to play on. Or they might want cricket pitches or they might want to go dirt bike racing. But why are people sitting in Whitehall trying to dream up what they want to do at their weekend and what they want to spend their money on whilst taking um, a heap of money from them um, every time they go to work in tax? And give it back to them, let them spend it themselves and they will naturally boost those areas. And I think um, quite a lot of the, uh, the government schemes that we've had over the past few years have, have really demonstrated um, the, the wrong sort of thinking on that. I mean, the, um, the Future High Streets Fund, um, for instance, and the, the town funds have really been good examples of those. I mean, so um, Stoke-on-Trent, where I'm from, is, is quite an unusual city. It's actually a linear city, um, so, which means it has six towns and six town centres. So it's got six decaying high streets rather than one. So you can, you know, it's, it's a wonderful example. You can walk through and see what's, what's wrong. And in some of those um, town centres, you've got these huge old mill buildings where they used to make pottery. And in some of them, they still do, but in most of them, they don't. Um, well, if you walk around central Manchester, there are also those huge old mill buildings and people have come in and turned them into really nice sort of luxury city centre apartments. Um, a developers are never going to go to Stoke-on-Trent and do that because after they've bought the property and spent all the money on refurbishing it, they can't sell them or rent them out for as much as they've spent on them because um, the property prices are so depressed. So yeah, you could have the government come in and spend £50 million on improving the high street and converting some old industrial buildings, for instance, to, to residential units. And converting in old industrial units to residential units might be what needs to happen. 
But if you change, you know, if you allow that local economy to grow and to actually be a vibrant local economy, that will happen on its own. And um, the government needs to, to to get out of the way of people and just give them more of their money back. And then, um, you know, rather than dreaming up new and fancy ways of spending it and all of these nice things which politicians like to go around planning will happen naturally without all of the backbench and local authority lobbying, which they currently have to do for years in and out of Whitehall departments to try and get a little bit of funding for their city. It'll just happen naturally. We just need to um, do something to... And um, to yeah, which is you know, goes where money goes back to these left behind areas automatically, rather than through petty little schemes, um, which might take five, ten years to do anything, and when they do arrive, isn't what people wanted anyway. That's true. It's an incredible summary of just let people keep their own money and decide, rather than taking it off them and giving it back to them with strings attached, which I think is what so many of these schemes often end up being. Um, thank you, uh, Tim and Michael, for joining me, and thanks to you for watching. You can read both of their entries to the Richard Koch Breakthrough Prize, as well as the eight other highly commended essays on the IEA website, iea.org.uk, or via the link in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to the IEA YouTube channel and click the notification bell to find out about all of our digital content. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at IEA London or on Instagram at IEA UK. And if you want to go a step further and support our digital, di work, our digital work directly, you can sign up to support the IEA on Patreon, where you get exclusive perks, benefits and priority access to some of our content. Head over to patreon.com slash IEA London or click the link in the show notes to find out more. And thanks again for watching.